All right. Hello, hello, guys. Today we are talking all about periodization of strength when you're preparing for a mountaineering adventure. Now, this is a relatively important subject to get your head around if you are leading up to a trip. And the intention behind this is just to give you a bit of an insight around a couple of different strategies for periodizing and planning out your strength training leading up to a big adventure. So you can get a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more understanding than what the traditional approach may be. So very, very briefly, if you haven't um, come across my stuff before, my name is Rowan Smith. I'm the founder of Summit Strength. And basically, I run a personal training service which specializes in working with trekkers and mountaineers. And I apply strength and conditioning into the world of trekking and mountaineering. And the big thing, big thing that I do is I get you fit, strong, and resilient for your dream adventures. Now, I always, always, always say that every single mountaineer should be doing strength training in their preparation. There are a million benefits around it and it's absolutely something 100% you need to be doing. Um, what we're talking about today specifically is periodization, which is basically the systematic planning of your physical training. And the aim in periodization is to reach your best possible performance in the most important point that you need. So in general team sport, that'll be before a competition. For you, it's gonna be for before your expedition. So planning out all your training, so you start from point A, build, 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 build. And by the time you leave on your trip and leave on your climb, you're gonna be in that 100% best physical position you possibly can be in. Because there's no point getting yourself ready for a trip eight weeks beforehand and then sort of falling off and going on downhill. So planning that out so you peak exactly the right time. Now, traditionally, endurance athletes use one type of periodization, and particularly mountaineers use one type of periodization, which has been popularized, but there are a few more other ways of going about it. And today, I'm just going to be explaining a little bit around these different methods of things you can do, just so you can have a little bit more variation, a little bit more flexibility, because I know the method at the moment, which everyone knows about, sometimes doesn't play out so well in the real life. So today, we're just going to explore a few different options for you. So to start off with, let's talk about block periodization. So this is the traditional periodization model for endurance athletes or mountaineers. And this has really, really been popularized for mountaineers by the guys at Uphill Athletes, who, if you don't know, are the sort of pioneers around strength conditioning for mountaineers. And the intention behind this is it's a really, really simple periodization model and which can take you from point A to point B and get you 100% ready to peak at a certain point. It's very, very easy to get your head around. The layperson can understand it very, very quickly. And that's more than likely why the uphill guys went about popularizing that. How they do it and how they recommend it and how many mountaineers will be pretty familiar with is it goes through three main um, phases. Phase number one is your transition period. So this is where you're coming out of doing no training or very, very minimal training. And you start with just getting yourself used to strength training. So this would period will go for anywhere from four to eight weeks. You'll do moderate loads and um, relatively um, yeah, moderate loads of exercises. Take yourself through, learn the particular lifts and particular exercises you're going to be training out throughout and just prepare your body for harder training throughout. Then you move on to the max strength period, which will be anywhere from six to 16 plus weeks, depending on how long you have in your prep. And the intention behind this period is to just develop your maximal strength and really, really go heavy, go high resistance and really, really challenge yourself. You basically take the same exercises from that transition period, load up the weight and just challenge yourself there. And then the next period and the final period is the muscular endurance period in which you this is going to be the last six to eight weeks of your preparation in which you take all that foundation work that you've been doing and bring it to a real, real peak. And you develop very, very specific muscular endurance for your event, which is sort of the main, um, the main determinant of success on the mountain is muscular endurance is one of those big things. And you're going to be taking all that work and converting into very, very, very specific muscular endurance work. So you might be doing this in the gym and you might be doing sort of higher repetitions, or you might be doing this like with heel repeats or, um, stair repeats or something like that and that's generally what most mountaineers are pretty familiar with and it just goes from moderate loads to heavy loads to lots and lots and lots of specific work and it works generally in theory quite well now the main variable here is that you'll change in your strength training is simply load so more or less you're doing the same exercises throughout if you're doing your gym based training transition period will probably be something from like 10 to 12 repetitions maybe eight something like that relatively moderate loads your max strength period will go from anywhere from two to six repetitions a very 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 um, challenging work your muscular endurance period will be anywhere from 15 20 plus repetitions uh, but you're keeping the same exercises more or less the same throughout and just changing that load and that's really really simple most people can get their heads around that now, in theory, this makes a lot of sense. And in a perfect world, it can be very, very effective. 
Meaning if you've got nothing else going on in your life, if you um, don't have any roadblocks, you don't get sick or anything like that, this can be a really, really good way of getting um, you ready. And sometimes just look in a nice 16 week plan, 18 week plan written out on paper. And you're like, you know what, this is exactly what I need to do. That can be super, super handy for a lot of people, but it does have quite a few drawbacks when it comes down into everyday life, because we don't live in a perfect world. There are so many other things that pop up and this method of periodization sometimes isn't the best one of adapting to this. And particularly as a self-trained athlete, sometimes it has to leave a lift to be desired for. So for example, um, injury and illness, there'll always be periods where you get sick, where you get injured, and well, maybe not injured, but it'll always be periods where you get sick, like go through um, levels of low, low energy. And this model doesn't really have a huge amount of flexibility inbuilt for that. For example, if you happen to get sick in the last like four weeks of your prep, when you're ripe, you should be peaking all your muscular endurance work and transition everything there that's going to be really, really a, a big drawback for you. The same thing is if you get sick right at the peak of your max strength work and you sort of miss out in that last two weeks of really, really intense max strength work, which you've been peaking for, might be a bit of an issue. Um, same thing for motivation. So there are going to be periods for most people on a long-term training plan where your motivation literally will go down. And in this particular model, if your motivation goes down in your muscular endurance period or right at the peak of your max strength period, you're going to be missing out on those crucial parts of your program and that's not going to be a great thing. Same thing for life events. There's always things that come up. So whether there's, you know, deaths in the family, whether there's like young children being born, whether there's big birthday weeks coming up, whether you're going on holidays, this particular model isn't incredibly flexible around that. There's also differences in adaptation. So people, everyone's different when it comes to training. And sometimes people will take longer to develop certain um, characteristics of training and adapt to certain training. So simply if you're getting a pre-made program written up for you and it says you've got a four week transition period, four weeks might not be enough for you to learn how to squat properly before you get heavy. For some people are different. Same thing for muscular endurance. Like some people, six weeks might not be enough to develop enough muscular endurance for what they need on the mountain. Everyone is a little bit different. So it doesn't give a huge amount of flexibility there. And then there's the potential loss for max strength towards the end. So if you are doing six to eight weeks of pure muscular endurance work without any maintenance of your maximal strength, the potential you're going to lose those adaptations slightly, probably not hundred percent, but slightly, potentially you're going to lose some of that potential benefits. And that might be a bit of a drawback there. That's potential. That's a root food for thought. So it's something to think about. So that's your block periodization, which most people are probably pretty familiar with. Um, next up is something that you may not be familiar with as a mountaineer. It's relatively popular in the athletic world these days, something called undulating periodization. So instead of just taking you from point A to point B, this is a little bit more flexible approach. Basically involves more frequent variation in training variables. So instead of having your transition, your max strength, your endurance period, you're sort of um, changing that up quite a bit more as opposed to doing eight week blocks, you're doing maybe changing things up quite a bit more frequently. So this basically allows you to train multiple fitness outcomes at the same time. Now for an everyday athlete, this will sort of allow you to train max strength, endurance, power, hypertrophy, or whatever you need at the same time or in the same period. For a mountaineer, pretty much what you need is endurance and strength. You don't really need power a huge amount. You don't really need, um, you know, hypertrophy, which if you don't want hypertrophy or extra muscle, so those ones aren't so relevant, but allows you to train fit, um, endurance and strength at the same time. Now, what this does is it basically um, undulates or changes between these training variables either daily, meaning changes each day you train, or weekly, meaning changing each week you train what you're actually trying to achieve. So, for example, in a daily undulating scheme, you might be doing max strength on Monday and you might be doing muscular endurance on Thursday. And you literally do that for your entire prep. Pretty straightforward. Or if you're looking at weekly, you might be doing maximal strength week one, muscular endurance week two, and alternate between those two for literally your entire prep. So that, that generally gives you a little bit more flexibility. If things are coming up, it helps you work on things concurrently. So if you are do have limitations in your strength, you know, uh, in your muscular endurance early on, which is holding back your training, you can develop that muscular endurance early. It can sort of work around things that come up in your life. If you get sick, if you get injured, if you've got family events coming on, it's not going to be the end of the world because you're not going to be missing out on things. And it does give you a little bit more flexibility. Um, with this one, many other training variables are used to progress. So seeing this isn't just set in stone, you'll probably get a bit more variation in your training. So you might not just be doing a squat for 20 weeks and changing the load, but you might change up different variations of the squat, or you might be doing one and a quarter reps. So you might be doing different tempos and things like that. Like just, you can get a little bit more creative with this type of stuff 
um, when you're doing this undulating periodization. There are a few drawbacks with this, which I will admit, and like there are always drawbacks in every approach. Number one, it definitely requires a lot more training history than a, a traditional block periodization will mean, will be, which means if you're not an experienced strength trainer and you don't have a knowledge around, you know, having been squatting for a while, having been deadlifting for a while or whatever you're doing, and you don't have a bit of um, experience to back you up, going straight into maximal strength in an undulating in either daily or weekly is not a really good thing because it does take a while to learn these movements. It does take a while to prep your body to, um, to do this type of stuff and going straight heavy is probably a recipe for injury. So you do need to be a bit more experienced for this. So it's probably not so recommended for anyone who's new to do arm um, strength training. Motivation, again, some people just don't like this. They prefer to have that long, long, steady build up and they prefer to have that pure plan leading up and they don't like that sort of every single week doing max strength and endurance. Some people love it, some people don't. Everyone's a little bit different, but some people deal with that. And then number three, it's not generally tested on mountaineers. Not a huge amount of people do this. Um, and it's definitely not written about a huge amount. So not that it's any worse. And there are reasons why our studies to say it's still pretty effective for, or just as effective for strength development. But when it comes to um, your confidence around the training program, some people really like to see that body, body of experience coming from people. Seen most mountaineers have done the block periodization. Most mountaineers are comfortable doing that because they know that it is successful. I'm not saying this won't be just as successful, but sometimes that can play psychologically um, a bit of a factor. So that is something to be aware of. So both of those methods can be effective, but they do both have their drawbacks and it can uh, be a little bit limiting. Another um, method of periodization, which is a little bit more modern and a little bit less set in stone is something that's called integrated periodization. So basically what this does is rather than progressing an athlete's sport, um, an athlete's sports training in accordance with pre-planned box of training um, sets and rep schemes. So meaning like we haven't planned this advance, we haven't planned that whole linear um, block progression in advance. We haven't planned out that we're going to be doing max strength, max um, and endurance every single week. That's not locked in stone. Integrated periodization lets emergent outcomes govern. So what that means is literally as you progress throughout the training, how things go, go, if it's going well, if it's going bad, if you're low in energy, if anything's going good, that determines what's coming up in the next block of training. So week by week or month by month or every couple of weeks, that is going to determine things. And that is a little bit more flexible. It's a lot more flexible. It's um, arguably a lot more effective because everyone's going to be different in different stages of their preparation. They're going to need different things. Everyone's going to um, respond differently to certain programs. So integrated periodization is sort of the method of just keeping things flexible, in all honesty. How this works is basically you'll sit down initially and decide, all right, what am I training for? What do I need to get better at? What are the considerations I need to think about? And then you write up a skeleton program. So this is definitely not set in stone. This isn't detailed around reps and, and weights and you know weeks and all of that. This is not set in stone, but it's just a sort of overarching thing that you're like, you know, this is what we're going to think might work right now. And then as you come through it, you adapt as necessary and you fill in those details as you go, as when you need what you need to do. And so you might do four weeks training and at the end of four weeks, you're like, you know what? I am feeling good. I'm ready to progress to heavier weights or I'm not feeling great. I need to work on this particular area or whatever. And it's a little bit more flexible and a little bit more adaptable. Now, the only real drawback with this approach is it does take a lot more what's known as art and a lot more experience. So if you're a fresh um, self-trained mountaineer and you might not have a huge amount of experience with uh, your own programming or anything like that, it's probably not going to be appropriate for you. This is probably someone who's going to be working with a coach or someone who has got quite a big, long experience in training themselves. And this is going to be a bit more appropriate. That's the main drawback, which is a big one for many people. But aside from that, there isn't a huge amount um, away from this. Now, how I personally go about my, my programming and my periodization for my mountaineers when I'm training them is I take a bit more of that integrated approach because I'm a coach, I sort of am pretty comfortable with that type of thing. So initially what we'll do is we'll sit down and we'll sort of have a think of what's the athlete's training history, what's their training age, how, many, how long they've been training for, do they have any particular weaknesses or strengths or limitations which have been flagged up in the initial assessments and screening which we go through, what are the actual fitness requirements of their particular climb coming up, how big is their summit day, how long is the expedition, are they getting Sherpa support or you know, guided support, have they got a full load, how is it going to play out, what attitude they're going to, what do they actually need for this trip. 
Um, what time available do they have? So both in a long-term perspective of, do you have 16 weeks to prep? Do you only have six weeks to prep, which is obviously not ideal. Do you have a whole year to prep? Um, and also time available in their week. Because again, that's sort of pretty relevant. Um, what roadblocks are going to be coming up? So if you are aware that there's periods where you're going on holidays or if you've got family events coming up or anything like that, that needs to be aware of. Um, obviously, there's always unexpected roadblocks coming up in your preparation and in your programming. So you can't account for that initially, but you want to be able to roughly schedule that out. And then obviously, you want to know an athlete's preferences. So ask yourself when you're coming up with this, what do, I, what do you generally um, thrive off? Do you prefer having something laid out? You're like, boom, 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 this is what I'm going to go for. Do you prefer to be a bit more flexible? Do you prefer to be a bit more, um, you know, manage, like to switch things up a little bit? This really, really depends on what you're at. So they're all very, very important considerations to go into it. Then from there, generally I'll do, and I'd recommend for you writing up a rough framework of what you want to achieve. And um, so you'll take the elements of that block periodization and you'll be like, all right, look, what, what elements of fitness do I need to develop in certain periods of my time? Um, generally it's like, I need muscular endurance by the end. That's a, a given for any mountaineer. Generally, initially, I probably need to have a bit of a transition period to get myself ready to exercise. And then you sort of pencil in other things around what else is going on. Um, and then you basically adapt as you go and you sort of just make judgment calls of how you're feeling, how you're progressing and away you go. As I said, it leaves a little bit more art, but it is pretty, pretty effective. So to put this in an example, so you can actually sort of see how this looks like, I'll give you a bit of a case study, the client that I um, worked with last year and still working with. And um, basically Ali, she came to me, she was attempting Makalu, which is just under eight and a half thousand meters. Um, she was training for that in eight months time. She had a big history of mountaineering, a big history of training, um, but she never really worked off a structured training program. So immediately when I heard, look, I haven't done a structured training program before, I was thinking block periodization sounds pretty good. Um, purely because that's simple to get your head around structure is easy eight months times a set in stone date we're going to be heading off and that's pretty good so that was the first thought in my head I was like look block periodization away we go um, but after getting on the phone with her and discussing a few things there are a few things that popped up which um, we need to be aware of number one she had um, a bit of knee pain and that was impacting her work um, presently so that was a high priority we need to get sorted straight away and that was the first thing we really need to get done she was heading over overseas for five weeks of ice climbing around month three of the program. So this was a big roadblock because in that period, that was the initial start of our, um, if we were on the block periodization, that would have been the initial start of our, um, our max strength period and also getting into some particular aerobic work. Um, so that was a big roadblock. And then she also said, look, the main priority is getting ready for Makalu, but I also want to be able to climb in these, in this period. I want to be climb all day. I don't want to be pumping out. So that was something we need to incorporate into our training. And then also the final consideration is she was intending on doing hypoxic sleeping in an attitude tent for the final six weeks of prep. Cause we discussed that. She said, I'll have this tent. I'm going to be using it. I was like, look, you need 250 hours in that tent to get the best benefits. And we worked out that six weeks for her. And so we were like, look, if we're supposed to be peaking at this six week period, I mean, this final six weeks, but you're also sleeping in a tent where your recovery is going to be impacted. You're not going to have huge energy levels and all of that. That's not a great combination. So we needed to think about that. So this is what we came up with after all that discussion. This was the rough skeleton framework, which we, I came up with her for her. Um, it was, as I said, this is rough. This is a skeleton. And I was very clear to her. I was like, look, this is what we're going to generally aim for. There are going to be things that come up in the preparation, which get in the way of this. There are going to be things that change. But as right now, this is what we're going to sort of aim for in each of these periods. So as you can see, there was a few think considerations we put in here. Initially, first four weeks, general strength training. This was just a sort of a transition period, but a big, um, a big emphasis into injury prevention and getting on top of those knees. Um, after those four weeks, we sort of were like, all right, we've only got six weeks till she goes away. We need to get some climbing work in, even though that's not something I've generally put in there. So we were working on general strength training and also climbing specific endurance. That's a bit mental if you look at a traditional block periodization, but that's what we needed to do to get ourselves happy. Leading to the final two works, um, two weeks before she went away ice climbing, we sort of transitioned into that. That was the start of a max, uh, max strength phase. And we only had two weeks and we transitioned to that. And then intentionally, that's never going to be enough to develop strength. 
but I knew she needed exposure to that type of training because we're not going to have a huge amount of time when she gets back to fit all everything we need in. So we needed to do at least two weeks just so she sort of got her head around that and also finish off that climate specific endurance. And then she went away for five weeks and the limitations there was like, look, I don't have access to a gym and there's a lot of snow, so I can't be doing a huge amount of work. Um, I'll be able to do a, some workouts at home, but in all honesty, that's not going to be the priority. So we were like, look, we're purely just going to be sitting at maintenance here. So I gave a one home strength workout that she'll be doing every seven to 10 days with a pack and with a body weight. And that was purely to maintain that uh, muscle strength she'd been developing over the last 10 weeks. And we were sort of considering doing a bit of strength development on a steep hill or steep stairs, but that just didn't play out. Um, as practical when she got over there. So about five weeks, we were purely on maintenance. Then we came back into the next period. Um, she had four weeks. So she got back into the routine, strength had dipped a little bit. She hadn't been into it, so just, um, doing a huge amount of leg work. So we had her to just ease her best self back in. Um, we started doing a bit of strength development on the hill based stuff as well. Um, but then also we wanted to transition her a bit into the endurance work because at that stage, we only had four, eight, 12, 14 weeks to go. Um, and she just hadn't really gotten that endurance in her legs and it was probably limiting her training a little bit. So we sort of brought in a little bit of that. And then four weeks to go, um, four weeks after that, at least this was a thought process. Oh, and then four weeks after that, um, we were sort of transitioning into our muscular endurance and then we we're sort of leading into that. So this is the framework and this is sort of what we started with and started working through and probably the first 10 weeks was probably pretty similar to that. But once you got back from the ice climb, it all sort of changed and we need to adapt and go through. But this is a bit of framework we worked off and so it gives you a general idea. It's like this definitely isn't block periodization. This definitely is an undulating periodization. It was a little bit different. Um, when it came down to it, when we actually got into the process, so there were a few roadblocks that popped up, which made us have to change things. So there's periods of fatigue where it was just like, she was just getting tired. She wasn't sleeping well. She had a lot of stuff going on, um, which led, led us to having to reduce um, her training volume has mainly worked out in aerobic work, but also it impacted her just ability to do the max strength sessions. We didn't want to cook out too much. So we needed to adapt a little bit there. And um, she had a big workload at times. So again, we had to limit her training time. Again, this more impacted our aerobic work, which is putting in big hours there. But we also need to make the strength training as time efficient as possible. Um, and then also there came a point where her leaving date changed. So all that prep where we were leading up to and um, peaking to that certain period of time that had to change and we had to be adaptable. So we had to figure things out and she was going to leave earlier basically, um, which led to us needing to incorporate muscular endurance earlier, which would lead us to having to cut out certain period, certain workouts that we needed. Um, the plus side of this is the hypoxic sleeping change. So then we sort of weren't in that conundrum of what are we going to do there, but that's sort of how it played out for her. And it was just a, giving you a bit of a real life, real life example of periodization and planning things in advance is just not really going to work. You got to stay flexible and you got to stay with it. As I said, flexibility was the key to entire prep and the outcome in the end, the trip was canceled. Coronavirus came around and that got canceled, unfortunately, but leading into her final stages of prep, she was feeling really, really good. Um, she had no injuries. So her knee pain was gone, no foot pain, no ankle issues, no back pain or anything like that. So that was great. And she was balancing it out with her life. So she was a, a fatigue levels weren't there. Um, she was feeling really strong. She was feeling fit and feeling really, really in a good foundation. So at that stage, it had all lined up. Unfortunately, we didn't get evidence on the mountain of how that all played out, but that's just a really, really decent example to get your head around particular periodization. So summing everything up, um, in all honesty, choose the approach that best suits you. If you love that linear approach, um, that block periodization approach, seeing everything lined out in front, um, go for it if you love it. If you like a bit more flexibility, the undulating stuff might be, or if you're a bit more experienced, and you sort of um, can play things by year, the integrated approach might be a bit better for you. Um, as I said, flexibility is usually better because um, there are always going to be things that come up. It's very, very rare unless you're a professional athlete who has no other um, things going on in your life. And um, so a really classic example of this, if you are behind a training program um, from a coach, and they're writing you up a program um, to prepare you for an adventure and it does deal with block periodization, you need to be requesting inbuilt troubleshooting. Meaning, if something comes up, if you get sick, this and that, 
you need to have action points that you can adapt and change and mess around. If it doesn't, that's a really big issue. Even better if you can get coaching support on these things. So you might not so much get weekly coaching support, but at least they can be there to troubleshoot when needed. And um, that's if you're buying a pre-planned tra- program, I'm always going to recommend get work with a coach, get a bit more flexible approach, let them do all the heavy thinking, the heavy lifting, and just make sure getting that expertise. But that's my, um, my recommendation. But if you are a self-trained athlete, there is nothing, absolutely nothing stopping you combining these approaches. And um, as you saw with Ali, there was periods where we were doing we did a bit of transition led up linearly like in a block periodization then we went through periods of undulating um and yeah it was it was really we sort of mixed and matched and that's generally what i do so there is absolutely nothing stopping you from combining these two approaches or these three approaches and really really just keep things flexible now obviously that's a lot to take in and i sort of brush the surfaces there on quite a few subjects but hopefully that gives you a bit of insight into a few different methods of periodization or planning out your strength training for your mountaineering trip just so you're not entirely locked onto that one method which is very popular in the mountaineering world now if you do need help with this um what I do is I literally do strength conditioning for mountaineers and trekkers preparing for their adventures. I put up, put together training programs. I give coaching, I give advice, I get them ready for the mountain. If you do need help with this, email me at rowan at summitstrength.com.au or you can check out my website at summitstrength.com.au. Um, alternatively, if you have any questions about any of this, just send me an email at rowan at summit strength um, and I'm more than happy to talk that through. But I hope you got a bit of insight into um, this video today, guys, and a little bit of insight into this very, very complex subject and hopefully it gives you a few ideas around how to plan your training out so you can get the best out of your preparations. So aside from that, hope you have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.